Okay, today we're going to talk about the basics of hypothesis testing. Here's a simple example. We have this claim that for adult females, the mean of their white blood cell count is 8. And then we take a random sample of 40 adult females, and we count them up, and we get a mean of that sample of 7.15, and a standard deviation of 2.28. You'll notice that's the standard deviation of the sample and not the population. So the population standard deviation is not known. Alright, let's write down everything that we know. We have that our sample size is 40. We have that the average right, of our sample, the mean, is equal to 7.15. We have the standard deviation is equal to 2.28. You'll notice that we didn't write this, right? Because we don't know that. That's population one. And we have a claim, right? You always want to identify your claim because that's going to be the tricky part is figuring out once we run our test and we come up with reject or fail to reject, then what does that mean about our claim? Okay. So our claim is basically that the average is 8. All right, can you see that? So now let's write up our hypotheses. So we have a null and an alternative. And we know that somewhere one of these two has to be our claim. Well since our claim has an equals in it we know that that has to be our null. Okay, was there anything in the question that tells us what the alternative is? And it doesn't look like it, so we'll just go for the standard that it's just not equal to eight. Okay, so if that's the case, is this going to be a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? Hopefully you're all screaming at the screen that it is two-tailed. And so now we can draw a picture of what we're basically testing. And I suggest you always draw a picture. And you don't have to be a perfect artist. As you can see, I'm not that great. But you just want a general idea of what we're testing. Since this is a two-tailed test, there are the two different rejection regions. Okay, well, we've skipped kind of one thing. How do we know how big these rejection regions are? Right? They always have to add up to our alpha level. And since it didn't say anything in the question, we're just going to assume uh, the good old standard of alpha is 5%, right? 0.05. So that means each one of these tails is 2.5%. I'll write it both ways. There it is as a percent, and there it is as a decimal. Okay, so now we can figure out what each one of those points are as our critical, right? We got to figure out our, well, first of all, is this going to be a T or a Z distribution? And since the standard uh, deviation of the population is not known, right, then this is going to be a T. So we're going to look for a T critical. And we can look that up in our table. We have N of 40. So we now know that our degrees of freedom are going to be 39. If you look that up in the table, you get a uh, T critical of 2.023. So this one is negative 2.023, and this one is positive 2.023. Okay, so we've done all the basic legwork. Now we just have to calculate our actual test statistic. So again, it's a T. Right? Our formula is X bar minus mu all over standard deviation divided by the square root of N. Plug in everything that we know. 7.15, we're testing it against 8. Standard deviation of our sample 2.28 divided by square root of 40 plug that into our calculator and we get negative two point three 
five, eight. So where would that land on our picture? Where would this land on our distribution? Well, this would be what, right about here. It's definitely in the rejection region. So we reject. Reject the null. Okay. So what does that mean in terms of our claim? Well, this was our claim. Right? So if we're rejecting the null, aren't we in essence rejecting the claim? So it depends on how you want to word it. Uh, sometimes it'll be things like um, the evidence does not support the claim. Or other times you'll see the book will use verbiage like uh, there is not enough evidence to support the claim. I don't like this one because that kind of makes it seem like the claim could be true we just don't have enough evidence to support it. And really, we've gotten some pretty good evidence. We have 40 pieces of data. That's a pretty darn good uh, size. And our data does not support the claim. So I just like this wording better. Does that mean this one's, this one's wrong? No. I just don't think it's as right as this one. Okay, let's try a second example. In this example, we have weights of discarded plastic and uh, we see that we have a sample size of 62 with an average of 1.911 pounds a standard deviation of our sample of 1.065 pounds they tell us to let alpha be 0.05 and our claim right is that the weight is greater than that right? so the claim is that the average weight is greater than 1.800 pounds so before we had a claim that was equal to something, now we have a claim that is greater than something. All right, so null and alternative. Can the null hypothesis be that mu is greater than 1.8? And the answer is no. Our null always has to have an equivalence in it. So this has to be the alternative. Now, up until recently, uh, the vast majority of statisticians really felt that your null always had to be just equals. Nothing but equals. Always had to be equals. So this would have been the hypothesis test a few years back. But some of us always had a problem with this because you're leaving stuff out this is equal to 1.8 this is greater than 1.8 what about things that are less than 1.8 where do those go so it's becoming more and more accepted that you can actually have an inequality in your null hypothesis as long as it has the equals portion so you couldn't say or I'll put this one in red so we know it's wrong we couldn't say that mu was less than 1.8 and that we were testing greater than 1.8 because this one doesn't have an equals portion in it but because we have an equals portion here with this one we're okay we're good to go all right so now the big difference between this one and the last one is that our claim 
is the alternative hypothesis this time. Okay, so again, draw a picture, figure out if we're doing a one-tailed or a two-tailed. Pictures always help. Alright, so if our alternative is greater than, are we looking for a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? Hopefully you're all screaming one-tailed, right? And since it's greater than, it's an upper. Right? In order to reject the null in favor of the alternative, something has to be bigger than a certain amount. It has to be uh, over this cutoff. And if alpha is equal to 0.05 and our n is 62, we use degrees of freedom of 61 and look up our t critical. Again, why is it a t this time? And the answer is the same as before because we don't know the standard deviation of the population. If you look this up in the table or with technology or whatever you want to do, you get a t critical of 1.6. Six, seven, one. So if our test statistic is bigger than 1.671, we end up rejecting the null. Alright, so let's calculate it. So <clears throat> it's going to be 1.911 minus the 1.8 that we're testing against all over our standard deviation, which was 1.8. 0.065 divided by the square root of 62. Stop that in your calculator and you end up getting a test statistic of 0 0.821. Which puts us, oh, who knows, maybe right about there. But all we know is it is not in the rejection region, so we fail to reject. Fail to reject. Now this is where it can get kind of tricky, is figuring out the verbiage that you now use to talk about the claim. Since we failed to reject the null, doesn't that mean that we kind of have to accept it? Right? We never use those words. We don't say accept the null. We just say fail to reject it. But if we fail to reject it, it's kind of like the null one, right? That was the one we had to choose. And if we chose the null, doesn't that mean we didn't choose the alternative, which means we didn't choose the claim. So basically, we're not supporting the claim. <clears throat> so the verbiage could be um, the evidence does not the claim or and what we oftentimes kind of see in textbooks is uh, there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim. Two different sentences pretty much saying the same thing. That we didn't land in that rejection region, so we couldn't reject the null hypothesis, so it's kind of like accepting it in theory. It basically just means that it wins, and since the claim was the alternative, then you know, we haven't supported the claim that the average is greater than 1.8 pounds. And those are two examples highlighting the basic principles of hypothesis testing. It's all about identifying what the claim is. Is the claim the null or the, high, or the alternative? And then you, you do your test. You figure out if you're doing a z or a t or a chi-square. We didn't do any chi-square examples, but the idea is still the same. You have a distribution. Draw a picture. Figure out if it's one tail or two tail. And then draw that in so you can actually visualize that it's a one tail or a two tail. Figure out what your uh, critical value is from tables or from technology. Then calculate your test statistic and compare them. Once you start getting the hang of this and you figure out the mechanics, 
then you can move on to using technology and our next example is how to use technology to answer these and we can actually figure out when to reject and fail to reject based on p-values instead of t-values and these charts. Okay, let's uh, look at how we can do this with our Texas Instrument graphing calculators. It's very simple. So for this one, we know we're doing a t-test, so uh, click on the stat button, go over to the tests menu, and this one is a very simple one sample t-test, so you'll see that later on uh, when we get into some more complicated things we can do two sample t-tests but for now we're just doing a simple t-test um, if we had the raw data, if we had those 62 pieces of data we could actually uh, select data put the number into our lists and uh, do it that way but since we don't we're just working with the stats so select stats and now you just have to fill in everything that you need to fill in this first one, this mu zero, that's our null mu. That's the thing that we're testing against. So in this case, we're testing for 1.8. <clears throat> and then x bar, that's pretty obvious. That's the uh, sample average, so 1.9.1. Sx, again, should be fairly obvious. That is the standard deviation from our sample. All right. N, that's our sample size, 62. Uh, the next one, this is what we're testing. Are we testing that we're not equal to um, mu, that we're less than mu, or that we're greater than mu, right? So um, we have to figure out uh, what kind of test we're doing. In this case, our alternative, right? The alternative was this greater than, so we're over here at greater than. And what I have to do is have it calculate. And you'll see that 0 0.8206 blah blah blah. That is the answer that we got over here, except it was just rounded. Uh, it gives us a bunch of uh, statistical analyses that we already had. This is in case we were doing it from a list, it would have given us that. But the most important thing is the p value p value of 0 0.207. Well, if alpha is 0.05 and p is 0.207, then the p that we got is bigger than alpha. And if p is bigger than alpha, what does that mean about rejecting or failing to reject? And you remember that if the p is low, the null must go, and if the p is high, the null must fly, meaning we fail to reject. So we get the same, same response here when we look at p values. It's just a little easier than doing it by hand.